Good afternoon, everybody. I'll go ahead and introduce myself and my co-host will introduce herself after I'm done. But to my broad audience out there, you all know me already. I'm uh, Sean Kennedy, Robert Sean Kennedy. Uh, I teach history, mainly U.S. history. And today we are going to, this will be our first podcast on the heart of darkness, hopefully one of many this semester and the spring semester. This launches our podcast pod, podcast series uh, which is the common reading text for the semester. This book has been assigned another to version of it. another version <laughs> of it. Yeah. Signed by many, many different um, uh, instructors in different academic disciplines. So thank you to the common reading text uh, committee for selecting this book. There's a lot to work with. Um, um, and so, yeah, why don't you introduce yourself to the fine people out there? Hi, I'm Liana Andresen uh, from the English department, and I've been at SCC 20 years. Oh, um, 17. Over here, I'm, I'm a spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been teaching on and off. I teach Heart of Darkness in literature classes. I teach it in rhetoric and now the semester in composition. So it's different levels of discussion, but it's always fascinating. So I... Just one thing, this book, it, it looks like a longer book, but the actual text, this is a critical version, so it has a lot of essays in it, but the actual book is much shorter. It's a novella. In fact, it's not that long, but it's dense. Right? Yes, indeed. Yeah, and that gets me to my first question. We're in good hands, folks. Um, this is the second time I've read this book. I read this book back in college, and when it was assigned, um, I picked it up over the summer, and, and yeah, this is a, another larger text because it has a lot of critical essays in it, but the actual text is like that small. And so I was like, yes, it's a small book. And then I started reading it and then I remembered, oh, this is a difficult read, <laughs> a challenging read, we'll say. And we're up for challenges, so let's not let that get in our way. But yeah, we're going to Today, we're going to talk about a lot of the controversy behind this book, and we're going to bring up a scholar, um, an author, uh, who commented and, and gave a lecture on this book, I believe in 1975, uh, Chawana Echebe, um, which is this book. Uh, he wrote this book, Things Fall Apart, which was basically a response to Heart of Darkness, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, one thing to any student out there who might be reading this book and going, what in the heck is going on? Um, Conrad is a masterful writer. He's incredibly concise. So it's a novella, but every single word counts. And it can be a, a challenge to even grasp the narrative because he's going to go in and out, leaning on literary devices to paint pictures. And there's a lot of symbolism a lot of themes about colonialism, racism, white supremacy, um, and the brutalization that goes on with it. But uh, I thought we would begin uh, the podcast by, since you've been assigning this book over the course of a couple of decades, what, what is some advice that you might give a student on how to approach this book um, if they are just for the first time opening up this book and it's an assignment uh, that they need? really give a good read on. So I'll just admit that um, I'm not, I obviously, I read it many times at this point, but every time I read it, it's it's almost as, as if I read it for the first time and I discover new things That's what makes every it a time book. I read. So, but what I want to say about it is that <clears throat> it was written at a time when <clears throat> literature was going into the direction of modernist types of um, devices and, and uh, techniques. And so you'll see some stream of consciousness, which comes later as a very defined technique <clears throat> with Joyce and in America with Faulkner. But, but it's, it's a lot of, um, it seems as if you kind of get lost in the weeds, <clears throat> but it's kind of a literary version of impressionistic. If you know impressionism in uh, painting, uh, like Monet, you know, there's it's an impression. So it creates impressions. And that's what he's trying to do. It's create glimpses of what it's like to be on a journey into a very different place and meeting very different people. But we'll go into that later, what kind of people 
Um, so read it as as kind of a just a, a journey into imagery and into um, a lot of symbolic language. But when you don't get something, just keep reading. That's my advice is to just read and read. And there's not that much plot happening. So you don't have to think, okay, what, what is going on? Not that much is going on. Um, I mean, we could just mainly uh, tell them what the plot is. Yeah. Um, yeah <clears throat> so these people on a boat are talking um, and Marlowe start gets into this um, story that he tells about his journey into what he calls the heart of darkness, which is basically um, in Africa and um, it's in the Republic of Congo, which is uh, today it's called the Republic of Congo. It was called Zaire for a little while. Um, so anyway, he goes into this uh, place, he's assigned, um, it's not too clear what he's assigned to do, but he's going to look for this person, Kurtz, who refuses to come back uh, with, well, he brings ivory, this ivory is the, the, uh, the word of the day. When you read, ivory is the task, the mission um, of many people who go there. So it's basically an economic purpose <clears throat> to get rich. But Marlowe, his journey was to, it, it was not really motivated for much more than he wanted adventure. But he's sent uh, to find Kurtz and he finds him eventually. And Kurtz is a very special character that we can talk about a little later, but Kurtz is, first we see him as a mystery, we start hearing his name. And then finally, when we meet him, it's pretty shocking what he does in the middle of the jungle. Basically, he's become like a little mini dictator in, in the jungle. Um, so on the way back, he, spoiler alert, he dies. <laughs> but he remains and in Marlowe's death, right? And it's very horror-filled, <laughs> his death. He, these are his last words, the horror. So this is... Not kind of the the word the word that sums up his experience yeah. and his own participation in in uh, what he's been doing. Yeah, not the last words one would want to aspire to on this earth, right? Yes. Yeah. You don't want to go out going the horror, the horror, the horror on your way out. <laughs> but uh, for for Kurtz, it was quite fitting. So I will give him uh, points for being um, authentic about that. Yeah, and for students uh, in a U.S. history class, my students perhaps, uh, that is being, this on the <clears throat> surface has nothing to do with U.S. history, but the themes that are explored as far as colonialism, which is a major theme in this book, um, we can look at as a template to apply to Western expansion, going back to the colonial era uh, as the British, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French are coming here. A lot of the themes you can use as a template going into US history too, Western expansion, going into the plains and the interactions of um, white settlers with people like the Lakota or the Cheyenne. A lot of the same themes uh, can apply here. Um, and perceptions of that experience too can apply here, um, especially the way history used to be narrated where you only got a very limited perspective, um, the, the side of the winners, uh, if you will. Um, things have changed quite a bit in, in the narrative of US history, but, um, and that's something we'll explore, especially when we get to Chuana Achebe. But yeah, this is about colonialism and colonialism is just a group of people representing typically a nation or an empire going in to extract the resources. And in, in this case, they're going in for ivory, right? Um, and I love how the book starts out too, because it's very subtle. What are they playing with when they're on the boat? They're playing with dominoes. And what are dominoes back then made out of? Ivory. So it's, it's uh, very specific what he's doing there. They're playing a game with ivory, right? Um, and then they decide, well, let's not play this game. We're going to, Marlo is going to give this long uh, narrative account of his journey into the heart of darkness. So we right. call that a narrative within the narrative or a story within a story, but yes, the focus is that narrative. Yeah, and that's where it can get a little bit challenging to somebody reading this book for the first time because it's, it goes in, in, in and out from the person, from the first uh, person account of, of the book to Marlowe's account of what he experienced. 
and the things that he observed. Right. So another literary technique that is kind of developing at the time, at the turn of the century between the 19th and the 20th is um, this subjective perception. So it's all, all we see is what Marlowe sees. So for example, when he meets people, sometimes he only gets glimpses of conversation and we don't get more than what he hears. So what he sees, what he hears, that's why it's a very personal story of Marlowe. And we see through his perspective from the beginning to the end. And that's how we kind of learn the mentality that he's informed by, that he's also kind of, um, that informs the whole narrative. It's the mentality of a person who is not, I mean, he's not really that interested in being a colonizer, but, and so he thinks he's better than, than the people who are actually colonizing that Africa. He's just there on an, advent, on an adventure, but he just completely illustrates uh, the mentality of the colonizer because he believes that he's better than the people that he encounters. He's an <clears throat> unwittingly uh, character in this narrative of domination. Um, yeah, and it's interesting of when it was written too, because we'll get into the criticism that Achebe is going to bring up. But um, one of the things that I'll that I'd like to point out, um, coming from Edward Said, is that to push back Achebe, just to cut to the chase, Achebe is basically going to call this book racist. He's going to call Conrad racist, and rightly so. Um, it's a very racist text. It's a very disturbing text. It's very uncomfortable, especially from a modern reader. But what I find interesting is if you really dive deep into it, um, one, you can't ever trust the narrator, right? It's, it's coming from a, a lived a subjective experience. He has his own interest and his perspective is going to change according to his conditions and what he sees. Um, and yeah, he's always going to look, he, he doesn't have anything nice to say about anybody right yeah he's he's a very um except he has some admiration toward kurtz yes so, uh, which is disturbing. disturbing. <laughs> incredibly disturbing <clears throat> um but it is written in 1899 and so when one does give this a very careful read it is clear that conrad did have to put it lightly some misgivings about colonization imperialism um and the brutalization that went with it which is Interesting, in 1899, this is even before the, this is just beginning in US history, the progressive era, which was a time of great optimism, right? People were thinking, wow, we have figured it out. We are the benefactors of the enlightenment, which is incredibly important to this text, the heart of darkness, right? Um, and so it's using, the heart of darkness is really leaning on an Aug um, Augustinian view of evil, which evil, isn't really anything, it's just absent of light, right? It's absence of goodness. Um, but people during this time are, are looking forward to the future. There's all these technological advances um, day to day. There's a lot of leisure time that has developed. There's a growing middle class, um, although obviously there's problems uh, with the industrial revolution, but there is a sense that yes, things are troubling, but they're only going to get better. That's all going to come crashing down once World War I happens, but that's still 16, 17 years off when this book is published. Um, so I find that incredibly um, interesting that he is kind of this voice of kind of raising his hand going, all is not well, <laughs> all is not well. Um, but he was quite skeptical. I mean, he, first of all, he was Polish. He yeah. was born in Poland. That's important. Which yeah. is also amazing the the level of writing in English literature that that he was able to produce when he was not a native speaker of English so he learned later in his life in his 20s he was not um, born in an English-speaking country but in any case uh, <clears throat> can I grab you some water there about water? sure yeah Continue. so he he was um he was very familiar with empires and with um you know being under some an, an empire because Poland was split between three empires, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. So it was not that he wasn't familiar with all of this and he was critical. And he was also critical of every empire. He talks, and I, I'm gonna read some quotes from the book where he compares the Roman empire with the British empire. 
Uh, so he had a lot of skepticism toward um, colonialism, empire, uh, also toward any system, basically. He was crit critical of the kind of fledgling um, socialism or other, other doctrines. But at the same time, he could not, um, he could not come out of this mentality. Thank you. He, so he reflects this mentality just as he's also trying to criticize it. So he's trying to be objective, but he still falls back on what he was probably born into and absorbed or internalized, which is kind of the mentality of we are superior, <clears throat> superior to somebody else. And this completely informs the way that he sees uh, African people when he finally encounters Native Africans. Yeah, uh, which is understandable too. I mean, I think one would be quite arrogant if they could say, I have stepped out of the confines of the period in which I live in. Even if you're making an attempt, you're still gonna be locked in with certain perspectives and running scripts in your subconscious that even though you might think you're being a good person, might come out in a way that is dismissive of other people and a reflection of the vast history of imperialism and conquest, which certainly Conrad uh, is guilty of. Um, but yeah, let's, if, unless there's something else that you'd like to talk about is specific to Heart of Darkness, I think the focus of our book is gonna be on Chowana Achebe. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to first point out I mean, to go into Achebe and his criticism of the book, I want to first point out um, this: some of the symbols that Achebe specifically tries to, to counter with his book. So first of all, so I was talking about the mentality of the colonizer, and this is what I it has been talked about in the uh, 20th, 20th century and, and 21st as the binary thinking. So just to explain a little to, to those not familiar with what binary thinking is, is it's the mentality where you split the world into categories and mainly two categories, us versus them, good versus evil, civilized versus uncivilized. Light versus dark. Light versus, so that's why the main symbolism of the book is related to light and darkness. So it's called Heart of Darkness is a person who's brave enough to go into the middle of the darkness. But of course, what he discovers is that the darkness exists in him and in the society that he left. But still, this idea that everything is in two categories, right? And everybody that he meets, he puts into one of these two categories. And the first, um, it's just a couple of symbols that are interesting in Heart of Darkness. They're, the first comparison that he makes is between um, the River Thames, which is the river in London, so it's always described as a described as a river of light, and this is of course not Marlowe because the this is not the first narrator that we hear. First is the action narrator of the book, and he is describing the Thames um, as basically um, so the sea and the sky were wedded to welded together without a joint, and in the luminous space the tan sail and the, of the barges drifted up with the tide. Uh, so he's just, it's a lot of description and most of it mostly is just talking about how <coughs> London is a city of light and even at night it's full of light. And then he goes a little further into description of the river Congo, um, which he describes, hold on. Um, so he's, he's talking about what drew, what, what, um, first inspired him to go into Africa. So he was looking at maps and then he saw this river on a map, which is, um, there was in it one river, especially a mighty big river that you could see on the map resembling an immense snake uncoiled with its head in the sea, its body at rest and, and just starts to, to derive other symbolism from that. But if you think about it, um, there's this light versus darkness. It's a river that is, and the, when he describes the jungle itself, he describes it as dark even during the day. So London is lit, lit <laughs> is full of light even at night. Um, Africa is full of darkness even during the day. So he's just basically making that comparison. Also the snake is a biblical illusion. So it's, it's already kind of insinuating that it's a place of evil. Mm -hmm. So, so that, a binary opposite opposition is, is set up from the very beginning. 
light versus dark. But then he goes into the most important binary opposition that he he exemplifies in in his mentality is that he cannot bring to bring himself to to call Africans people. So from the very beginning, he calls them ants. He calls them uh, black shapes. He calls them. He compares them to cows when they're coming to drink water. Um, mm. Even when he feels sad, he feels sorry for them when they're some of them are prisoners and they're mistreated and they're dying. But still, he cannot bring them, himself to to call them humans or human beings. So he and he also compares them to the surf. Um, the first time he sees them on little boats, he says that they are as wild as the white the waves, the rough waves of the ocean. So to him, they're just part of nature. That's that's the most disturbing description that, it, again, he is critical of colonialism in some ways, but not of his own mentality where he thinks that he's superior because he's British. And he also calls London the greatest city on earth. So compare that to the place where it's swampy and full of creatures. And also the, another thing that Achebe picks up on and, and brings up in his book is the fact that the people there, so when he gets in on his journey, he, he, there are tribes on the, on the uh, banks of the river. He doesn't really interact much outside of the boat. Uh, so that's another um, criticism is that he never actually tried to learn the culture of the people that he was encountering. So basically he was staying on the boat with his own people although they had some Africans on the boat, but I'll mention them in a, in a second. But in any case, he doesn't immerse himself in the culture. So what he sees is glimpses of people and he likes to describe them by body parts, the eyes bulging, the limbs. So instead of saying a person, he says a pair of eyes. So it's everything that he does in descri describing the Africans is dehumanizing. So also he talks about the drums that he hears and he's not sure if they're celebrating or cursing, or he says he's imagining what the drums might mean. And this is another thing that Achebe picks up in his book. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the drums being this meaningless uh, noise to, to Conrad. And by the way, Conrad didn't make up most of this thing. Most of this narration is based on his own or partially based on what he experienced when he went into the Congo. So Conrad himself was kind of a- He was a seaman for yeah, a long time. So yeah. he's very familiar with um, yeah, um, boats and also um, Africa. He, he went to Africa and he some of his essays that describe the place are guilty of the same, um, are basically showing the same mentality that he thinks is superior because his because he's white, basically, because yeah, he, he himself was not British. Marlowe was, but he himself is Polish, but still considers himself superior. But one thing that he, so sorry if I take too no, much. No, no, please go. But, yeah. Um, one thing that I, I like to point out from the beginning when I teach this is that, yes, he says, well, he basically says that England itself was a place of darkness yes. before the Romans came. So it says it's not by nature necessarily that they're superior because it's basically how much you've advanced in civilization that he thinks makes you, makes you superior or inferior. So he thinks he calls Britain a place of darkness before the Romans came. And then he says the Romans came and they were just like me, like me in the jungle. He, they, they only saw like swamps and savages in the bushes but since the nights he says the light light has come to england um and and now he compares the romans to the british this is on page 10 in my book here he says um mind he began again lifting one arm from the elbow he says mine not, none of us would feel exactly like this like the romans did so we're not exactly like them. Why? He says, what saves us is efficiency, the devotion, devotion to efficiency. And a little later on, he says, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves is not a pretty thing. 
when you look into it too much. So it's this ugliness that he knows is going on. I mean, millions were killed during colonialism. It's not, oh, it's not as bad as conquering like the Romans did. You know, they just go and slash and burn and rape and pillage. No, the British were colonizing. They were bringing civilization. But he says, what redeems it? What redeems colonialism, he says, is the idea only. There's an idea that redeems the action which is very disturbing to think about. So he says, yeah, there, there are many people who died, but it was for a good cause. And if you're familiar with The White Man's Burden by <laughs> Kipling, that's, it's a poem that was written around the same period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and where he was saying, it's very hard to be a white man because you go there and you do all these things for these savages who are a little more than children and they still are not grateful to you. And they still treat you badly. So it's the same kind of idea here in this book that you are right to do this, even against their will, even against, even if they will hate you. You're bringing them enlightenment. You're bringing them knowledge. You're bringing them. But this idea was always, and you'll see this in the history of humanity, even in the 20th century, 21st century wars, What what is behind the war, the war. It's always an idea, right? We're bringing them freedom. We're bringing them whatever you want to replace. I mean, the uh, propaganda related to war is always about an idea, but behind it, there's oil, right? There's always an economic purpose, territory, but it, there's always an idea that is put, sometimes it's a cross that is put in front of the war effort, right? Or or flag, or you know, something noble, something ennobling. But behind all of that, just in like in American uh, colonization, the mur the genocide of Native Americans was also done in the name of something good. So it's obviously a, a paradox, or it's it's not a paradox. In the, fact, it's just near of a sort. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lie. It's a lie that it's a noble purpose. But some people really believed that they were doing something good. And for example, in, in Heart of Darkness, there are these pilgrims, right? And <laughs> so they're traveling on, on the Marlowe's boat um, toward Kurtz. I mean, they have a different purpose, but um, <clears throat> so it's interesting that they have a few natives on the boat with them and they, they kind of create this complete division between us and them on the boat so Very this small is not, boat. <laughs> yeah. But those, uh, so the natives that they they employ, so this is supposed to be, we're not forcing them, we're employing them, and they're paid in wire. So, so he realizes that something is not quite uh, doesn't add up here. So they are supposed to bring ivory, and they're supposed to help them create all this wealth for white people, and they're paid in copper wire which is supposed to be kind of a precious commodity, but, but in the end he says they can't really use the wire anywhere. So they basically are starving on our boat. They have some hippo meat, which, which the pilgrims throw overboard because it starts thinking. Yeah. So then they have very little, they have some grains or some uh, like a you know, root that they eat from, but he's just surprised. This is one other passage that is very, um, telling is that he's how is it that they don't they they didn't eat us because they're supposed to be cannibals also yes, that's a, they're called he, he calls them the cannibals and he says we threw their food overboard and they have restrained he says <laughs> restrained where's my restrained passage he says i okay my restraint restraint i would just as soon have expected restrained from a hyena prowling amongst the corpses of a battlefield. So what he doesn't want to understand is that why doesn't he get it? Why do they have restraint? Because they also have values. They also are human. They also have um, their own rationale for everything they do. And they also aren't cannibals probably. And they also <laughs> probably aren't cannibals, which probably they derive from some I don't know, prisoners of war, there were maybe, yeah. um, 
we don't know exactly, but yeah. just to finish this, when he encounters Kurtz, he realizes Kurtz is the one who, with no restraint. Mm -hmm. So to create, to fin finalize the contrast, what he realizes and he learns is that, and he says Kurtz, like all of Europe contributed to creating Kurtz because he has kind of German and British blood and something and is like the epitome of European civilization. And in fact, he is the darkness that he encounters. So, and he's the one with no restraint. Yes. So that's kind of my spiel about Card of Darkness. So I can yeah. uh, talk Real about quick, a bit. You brought up, um, <clears throat> yeah, I thought that was an interesting passage. He's hearkening back 1900 years ago when the Romans first got to Britannia um, and bringing light to this darkness. And it's uh, for US history students uh, in 1302, it is the exact same mentality as Frederick Jackson Turner, right? of this idea of this moving line of civilization from east to west. And um, from that narrative, but it's interesting in this book, I'll talk about that in a second, the darkness is from the east, and as you go west, the light comes, right? And so Turner was talking about the conquest of the west. Um, he wouldn't use the word conquest, but that's what he was talking about, of bringing civilization to this place and it being basically this good thing because um, not to go into too much detail about Turner, but it becomes an outlet for younger generations of, of European settlers and Americans alike that can go West once the natives are cleared out and, and not such a burden to settlers. Either who might... killed or converted. So exactly. Either right? they accept but... our version of civilization or it's okay to kill them because it, they belong to the devil. Right. I mean, that was, the Puritans thought that. Yeah, uh, it's Americans. it's okay to and what and if you, if there's no religious justification, it's okay to kill them because they're in the way of progress, right? And it's their deaths are. You might be sad about their deaths, and you might have some commentary about their deaths, but things are getting better, right? And so, you know, yes, the Mexican American War, we the United States conquered two thirds of Mexico's land, but we got California. Isn't that good? Right? Can't we get something good out of this story? Right. And so, yeah, a very interesting. This is why um, on the surface, as a student, you might be reading this and going, <clears throat> well, where is Theodore Roosevelt in this book? Where is, you know, I don't see anything about U.S. history in here. The, it's there. It's, the, it's, a, it's a template that you could apply to any conquering people throughout history. Um, even the Romans were going to bring the, the greater glory of Rome to the, the barbarians, right? Um, so this is part of the binary. Mm -hmm. It's us versus them. It's always <clears throat> part of, um, I guess, the human tendency to, to define yourself through an opposite. So, I mean, this is how we identify the enemy as an other. And this is the psychoanalysis and deconstruction theories have emphasized this a lot, how we take comfort in... Um, dehumanizing somebody else because it gives us the confidence that we are human, that we are good enough, that we can define ourselves by contrast to somebody who doesn't have those qualities. So that's why you see always still to this day, a discourse of them versus us, right? They are, um, it could be even immigrants or something that is talked about today, defi helping define you by contrast to the other. So the other could be anybody, could be, you know, the original immigrants, the Irish, or um, like in American history, Irish, the Italians, and, and then the uh, freed slaves, <clears throat> so African-Americans, and anybody who was not part of the mainstream society, that's the us. Yeah, the in and out groups. And I would say it's particular to any group of people <clears throat> and or individual within a society uh, that has a culture of alienation, right? That there is there, there is another, right? And so one of the things I think is always fascinating when you're, especially when you're studying early history um, for my US History 1301 students, when Columbus first approaches the Arawak, they run up and greet them and are have stuff to trade and it's almost a celebration and they have no idea what they're getting into. And it's not because they're naive, it's not because uh, they have no sense of self-preservation. They, they 
probably most likely didn't understand what it was to be alienated, to, to look at other people as others. To them, it was, oh, new people, they've got stuff, we've got stuff, let's trade, right? And so, yeah, whenever you um, hear about people othering other people, or if you find it within yourself, which since we live in a Western civilization, we're all uh, uh, susceptible to this, understand that it's coming from a sense that there's me here and there's other people there and there's other ways of approaching life. Uh, and this, I don't wanna to go too deep into it, but it's, it's very philosophical and, very, and many of the great faiths talk about that, that you're delusional if you think there's others out there. It's of one body of one mind and the extent that you other people, you know, this is what sin is, you've missed the mark, right? You're, you're not seeing that it's, it's, it's a happening. You have more in common than. Exactly. <clears throat> right. More in common and not even just that, but it's, it's all just this unfolding that's going on that you are um, almost not even an appendage of, but just this outgrowth of the happening that that's going on, which I think a lot of people uh, prior to civilization um, probably lived on a day-to-day -day basis. It was, um, a, 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 a profound relationship with the creator, uh, because they were part of that creation and understand and everything was of that creation. Um, and more connected to nature. <laughs> yeah. Nature yeah. And your, your point about how the people, the, the natives of Africa are seen as part of nature. That's such an, an insightful observation because, uh, human beings from the Western perspective are outside of nature, right? And this is out of- And we're here to conquer and to, yeah. to control nature to our it's individual egoistic liking. Nature, yeah. But nature always, we can't <laughs> defeat the hurricane. We can't, you know, uh, nature will always find ways to, to, to come back mm -hmm. and to see ourselves as, you know, different from nature. This is actually self-destructive. So that's another point that he actually, <clears throat> where he's misguided in the in the heart of darkness when he talks about basically he talks about the jungle as this kind of entity that is so foreign when, and he says trees it's like were another, kings <laughs> and he says it's <laughs> almost like line. another planet yeah uh, but he says one thing one thing that is very interesting in this in his admission that he feels kinship with this nature with this wilderness and with the natives and he says that um, if I can find quickly, um, basically he was saying that, um, and this is where he describes it as the heart of darkness. He says, um, the earth seemed unearthly. We we're accustomed to look upon this shackled form of a conquered monster, which is nature. So civilization is conquering a monster, right? But the monster remains, and instead of working with nature, people try to kind of subdue it and tame it and, and then see, say that they're different from it. But he says that if you are man enough, you would admit to yourself that there was in you just the faintest trace of a response to the, the terrible frankness of that noise, which is the drums in the, in the bushes. So, so basically he says, yeah, there's a kinship, but it's ugly. He says it's ugly, but you have to admit that part of you is wild still, but you have to tame it in the name of civilization. So you have to tame yourself, basically. So <clears throat> that's also part of the, I guess, the, the Victorian type of British sentiment that every, everybody has to tame and repress. And, and that's when Freud living came in, and says, everybody's too repressed. Living in let's... desperate, des <clears throat> quiet desperation. Um, well, let's move on to Achebe. <laughs> Um, so this book is probably considered one of the top 100 books of 20th Ever. century literature. It's, it's, it's a pillar of Western civilization literature. And I, I, to my knowledge, um, and I could be wrong on this, it remained uncriticized until 1975 when Chawana Achebe is like, this book is terrible. <laughs> this is a racist book. It's a racist text. And he gives this lecture and then he goes on to write, Things Fall Apart, which is a response to this, which is gonna bring um, 
a sense of humanity to these people, not caricatures at all. There's deeply flawed characters in there. But he, he says in this lecture, I, I thought this was great, and then we can we could springboard from here. This is a Chebe. The West seems to suffer deep anxieties about the precariousness of civil, of its civilization and a need for constant reassurances by comparisons with, comparisons with Africa, trapped in primordial barbarity. It could uh, it could say with faith and feeling, "There go I," but for the grace of God, right? So. Um, yeah, basically Achebe is going, the problem with Western civilization, or they are constantly saying, look how great we are, look how great we are. And one doesn't need a psychology degree. If you run into a person who's always talking about how great they are, you realize that that person is deeply wounded and is covering up quite a bit and very insecure, <laughs> right? Somebody who's truly great is just going to navigate through life and every other people go, wasn't that person great, right? And the person- and just had, be inspiring without saying, yeah. I am great. Yeah, so um, yeah, let's, we've got uh, a good 20 minutes left. So let's get into Achebe's specific criticisms of this book. Okay, so um, when I teach uh, <clears throat> Heart of Darkness and Chino Achebe in, in um, rhetoric, where we talk about argument, I see this as, in, in rhetoric, we always talk about what's the opposite side or what's the counter argument. So uh, things fall apart is a counter argument to uh, heart of darkness. Almost, I mean, it, it really doesn't have the same characters. It doesn't, it's not in this, doesn't take place in the same exact place where heart of darkness is, but it's a general um, response to it. So, so you're not going to find Marlowe, but there's some Characters that remind you of, of Marlo, for example, at the very end of the story, the main character, Akanko, uh, kills himself, and somebody comments at the end that it could be a nice paragraph in a book, uh, this, this story, because it was so weird of the character. So um, turning people into words and putting them, pinning them down in a book means that you basically taking away their, their humanity or their, try, they, that's what colonizers did when they wrote about the brutes as Kurtz actually calls them. So anyway, and I have three things that I, I want to point out in, in uh, Things Fall Apart that respond very directly to, to Heart of Darkness. Um, so one thing, which is in chapter two, um, <clears throat> is describing, so let me just say a couple things about what happens in, in, in Things Fall Apart and then I'll, I'll talk about these three things. But it's basically Akanko is this uh, very esteemed person who's built his life almost against the stereotype of his father, who was kind of lazy and an artist, and he just didn't have um, the big thing that to show your your uh, worthiness is to as a man is to raise yams and to feed your family and to have a large family. So having more than one wife and a lot of children and you can feed them basically that shows your worth and also to be a good warrior and also to be a good athlete so these are qualities that a conquer the main character has but then the europeans arrive <clears throat> arrive at that place and suddenly everything is turned upside down because his his child who's really not a very stereotypical male uh so he's more artistic maybe more like his grandfather so his child joins the new religion. So it's like the Christianity, they build a church in town. The Africans try to give them, uh, they, they tell them, take the, the, the cursed forest. To, they have a forest where they, a lot of, um, they bring people dying or their abominations are taken to this forest. So they say, okay, let's put them in this forest. Let's let them build a church on that land <laughs> and nothing happens. And like, oh my God, how, how did that how is it that our gods didn't strike them down? So they must have some powerful medicine or some powerful God. So anyway, things start falling apart in their society. And in the end, the people who are able to adapt, that's what happens is that who can, whoever can adapt can survive. So people who are more uh, flexible in some ways and, and they can learn from the newcomers and realize that they're not gonna go away completely and 
um, that they're more powerful, they have more powerful weapons and things like that. And finally, Kanko, who was very traditional, was very kind of has a mind to preserve his own culture. Obviously, he's fighting for his own culture, but he is um, forced to, to give up basically, because he can't adapt. So he finally kills himself because he, he finds no other place in this new world for him, which is a very sad story of the main character, but other characters around him find ways to, to remain there and preserve their culture. For example, Chinua Achebe, is, he wrote, he's a contemporary, he died a few years ago and he taught in America. He, so he's, he's writing from that perspective of the past, but he writes from our more modern understanding of what was happening. So he is one person who preserves that culture. But in any case, the first comment directly to the heart of darkness is um, where he's talking about darkness. So he says, the night was very quiet. It was always quiet except on moonlight nights. Darkness held a vague terror for those people, even the bravest among them. Children were warned not to whistle at night for fear of evil spirits. Dangerous animals became even more sinister and uncanny in the dark. A snake was never called by its, na its name at night because it would hear. So what, what he's trying to do here, of course, it's a different culture with different maybe spirit, types of spirituality where uh, they, have, uh, they have oracle, they have God, they have an oracle in town, they have gods, um, they have wise men in, in the tribe, but, but they also are afraid of darkness. So what he's trying to comment on is that we are not the darkness. We also have our own interpretation of the world around us. We, we have our understanding of nature, but there are things in nature that scare us too. So he's, all, he's rebuilding that humanity that Conrad was taking away from, from Africans in his description. So, this comment is kind of a, a little tongue-in-cheek um, direct comment on the darkness. But, but also he kind of builds up this culture. First of all, Conrad was almost saying that there was, when he describes it in Heart of Darkness, uh, when he was Marlowe, when Marlowe became um, interested in that adventure in the Heart of Darkness, he was looking at, at a map and saying, there's a blank spot on the map. I want to see where it's blank. So Achebe is trying to say it wasn't blank and it wasn't uncivilized. We had our own, or African people had their own civilization, their own religion, their own knowledge, culture, language. And so um, he gives some examples of the values that they, they had. For example, we shall all live. We pray for life, children, a good harvest and happiness. So what he's trying to say is, what he's trying to do in this book is not alienate people from other cultures to say, well, we are better than you. He's saying, no, we have our own. We had our own at that time. Today is also, of course, a mixture of cultures today. But in any case, he's trying to humanize to show we have similar values. We value children, harvest, family. Uh, it's not a blank space with demons in the bushes. Um, so the second thing that I wanted to mention that is a, a complete um, counter argument to, to Heart of Darkness, he talks a lot about drums because that was one thing that scared Marlowe. What is it? Are they cursing us? Are they praying? Are they, what is it? It's, it's almost like an unearthly scared sound. scared plantation owners. Yeah. When West Africans were enslaved, they made it illegal. And we're playing those drums. And, because and, it was alien. And it was alien. Them. And they were able to communicate. You know, there were slave revolts communicated through drumming. And so when they caught on to that, it's like, no more drumming. <laughs> That's an, an interesting detail. I didn't know about that. So he says, um, so drums appear in the book everywhere. So every festival, every event in the life of the tribe. Um, is so it's the Igbo tribe. Um, any every event is marked by certain drum sounds. Um, so the different kinds of um, sounds that are for a funeral, for festival, or different aspects of their lives are marked by celebrating with with the sound of drums. And he says, um, 
The crowd has surrounded and swallowed up the drummers whose frantic rhythm was no longer a mere disembodied sound, but the very heartbeat of the people. So he connects the drums to their very being, who they are. It's a form of uh, creating identity through art, through expression, through music. I mean, um, if you think of other instruments in, in um, either, even Western society, right? Uh, people kind of build identities around music, around instruments and art, artistic expression. So he's trying to make that point that it's not anything alien. It's part of who we are and, and it's an expression and it, it's a celebration. And I, when I teach this book, I, I have a, a little video on YouTube. Um, I can maybe send a link later for anybody who's interested, but it's, it's a 12 minute video made uh, somewhere in, by a group in Africa. It's called um, Everything is Rhythm. So basically they show drums and they show how everything in our lives is marked by rhythm. It's not necessarily that it's just artistic, but it's also, celebrating being alive because the heart is an expression is a of the heart yeah yeah it's mm -hmm. like a that's why it's a heart a literal heart so yeah so it's 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 something that keeps your community alive is being having a common heart meaning having mm -hmm. common values having common aspirations so the drum is very symbolic and very important in in Machibe's book kind of a counter to what Connor was doing it's like it's just something wild in the bushes. Yeah, and I think Chebe's main criticism is Conrad fails to humanize any African. He doesn't call them by their names. I mean, the closest we get is to the helmsman that he has some sort yes. of sympathy for, but he ends up mocking him. They throw him overboard after he's killed by the natives, right? And it's yeah, but he says that he had that, a bond with that mm -hmm. helmsman, and he says to his audience, mm -hmm. Marlo is talking to the boat, to people on the boat, he says, I missed him. Mm -hmm. He says, it's weird. You're going to judge me because I missed a savage. <laughs> but you don't understand. He worked for me. He did something for me. So he was like an instrument. So it's like saying, well, I wrecked my car. I missed my car. So it's kind of. Or would it be more like uh, the trope of the good one, right? And so this is yeah. a common trope of white uh, versus black relations. White, uh, you know, somebody who has racist mentalities who might have a friend who happens to be black and it's like well you're not like them you're you're a good one right that kind except of except he doesn't he never goes to the point to, of calling him a friend okay it's like he was my instrument okay not my friend mm -hmm. but i miss him so he allows himself an emotion but he doesn't want to name it to to humanize him for that because he triggers an emotion in him so yeah, it's and he still probably get, would get ridiculed by the other guys on the boat right if you went too but far he, with it yeah and he yeah. has a weird reaction. I mean, he, he takes his socks off. He's kind of has a, an emotional reaction. But mm -hmm. to try to, when he sits down and tries to understand why he's reacting like that, well, I guess because he was an instrument. And I miss that instrument. Mm -hmm. So he just, against himself, almost despite, in spite of himself, he says, no, it's because he was useful. That's it. It's more of an othering. Yeah. So he yeah. remains in that position of, he's still an other. Mm -hmm. So with Achebe, just one more thing that I wanted to point out in kind of the counter argument that he creates in this book, and this to me is the most interesting part, uh, because it, I'm, um, I love discussions of language. So this is the idea that Conrad was, he never tried to learn any of the languages of the natives. He just They were making grunts. They were making not really human language. So unless they learn English, that doesn't count as language. So well, I'm glad that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I mean, Westerners tended, and even in the United States when it was colonized, I mean, the territory here was colonized. It wasn't, not a lot of people would try to learn native languages. Oh, of course they, not. Yeah. That's they have to learn English, otherwise they die. Yeah. And There's that. Great joke when he calls someone who speaks three languages, trilingual, what do you call someone who speaks one language or two languages, bilingual, what do you call someone who speaks one, an American. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so there's only one acceptable language. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So what he does in this book, 
first of all, here and there, he, he actually uses um, words and it, there's a um, little dictionary, where is it at the beginning or at the end? You can, I mean, he, he even has, okay, there's a glossary of Igbo words and phrases. So you can see a lot of the ones that are used, for example, Akbala, which is a woman, Chi is a personal God. So kind of a karma type of thing. This is just um, a richness of language that he even exemplifies with, with um, words from the Igbo language. So, but the funny, I mean, and also, so the, the, some words he uses for to create kind of a, to, to maybe create a little local color, but, but also he has a lot of, there's a wealth of phrases and proverbs and, and wisdom that comes from, from um, basically the specific expressions of that, their language. So they have a lot of sayings that are, can you be used in every occasion, uh, on any occasion. And so it's, it just, he wants to show the richness of this language that Con was, Conrad was calling just grunts, but they have a wealth of, a wealth of wisdom and, and a rich language that he's trying to, to portray in this book. But one funny thing, I mean, the book has also a sense of humor. It's not quite as dark as Heart, as Heart of Darkness. Um, so when the first white people appear, there are people telling stories of the encounters with the first white people. So, and then there's like gossip and rumor, like what did they do, what happened? And um, so Akanko was talking to somebody who had seen, um, who had seen the white people and they tried to speculate, are they albinos? No, no, not an albino. It was quite different. Um, and they say he was riding an iron horse, which was a bicycle. But anyway, they ask uh, this person who had seen the white person. So what did the white man say before they killed him? Because they did kill the person on the, on the bicycle. And then there's a whole revenge that the whole village is obliterated because of this one person who was killed. Um, so what did the white man say before they killed him? He said nothing, answered one of Obirika's com companions. He said something, only they did not understand him, said Obirika. He seemed to speak through his nose. <laughs> so this kind of a, he's making a, a like a kind of a strain. Yeah. It's, so it's just kind of yeah, mocking the, the sound that they don't understand. But first, the first description of the language of the newcomers is they said nothing because we didn't understand him. So to us, it was nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's only meaningless if you don't know it. So it's basically, he's trying to say, it's your lack of knowledge that turns, that dehumanizes people and turns them into wild savages that don't have a language, don't have a culture. It's your ignorance that dehumanized them, not because they were the way that you described them and not because they were inferior. To them, you are inferior. So when they first see the white people, they make fun of them. They, um, they try to, to first, they, they try to fight them, then, uh, finally, they accept that they can't completely get rid of them. So some people start adapting. Some people start to learn the language. Some people, so they understand that you can't completely um, create a wall to, and, and that's, you know, walls never work in, in trying to separate what you consider the enemy or the other. So the better way is to interact with the other and to learn from each other. So that's kind of how, the book ends with, of course, it's a tragedy because the main character dies and he just cannot understand the new world. But the people who survive are the ones who understand that they need to communicate, that the culture, mm. it's a cultural exchange. And in a way, I think that Achebe was trying to not completely destroy or demolish Conrad, but to say, well, we are not perfect either. Right, we and there, there's some disturbing things happening in in the tribes, like killing when there are twins born, they kill them because they consider them an abomination. There's some things that they do, especially a conqueror has, you know, he beats his wife, he does some things, some bad things. He's punished by his. Oh yeah, that's it. It's almost a counter to Rousseau, which he kind of romanticized 
you know, the natives. And he's not romanticizing. He's also showing how yeah. deeply patriarchal it is and how mm -hmm. men have more power than women. And sometimes they, they abuse it because <laughs> they're words. human. Yeah. And they're, he's kind of showing there's much more in common mm -hmm. uh, yes. that we have. I mean, of course, it's a different culture. Of course, it has its own peculiarities. Or of course, it has its own um, wisdom and, and yeah, religion and but everything. to counter Conrad, it's not of a course, right? It's like to the, the, it, there's trees and there's these natives and there's these weird rivers. It's just this chaos and it's yeah. barbarism out there. It's like there's actually human beings that you could talk to and get to know and, and learn from, which yeah, I think that's the value of things fall apart. It's let's now learn from these people and you might like some of the stuff. You're definitely not going to like some of the stuff, but this is who they were which is void in the heart of darkness. And that's, I think, the main criticism. That uh, And by their definition at that time, you were nothing. Mm -hmm. You, They also saw you because they didn't understand you. Some people thought that's either the devil or yeah. some evil, some, some kind of representation of evil or just something to reject yeah. and to be afraid of. And it also... The idea in both books that I get out of it is that the main reason why we create an other to hate in order to define ourselves is, is fear. It's fear of being changed, fear of being destroyed by somebody who's different from you. I mean, there's fear of the different somebody who's different from you because either they may try to change you or it may try to take your place. Mm -hmm. So I think fear is at the basis of, or it, it's kind of the main engine to, to aggression. And that's the psychoanalytical concept too, that the other is based on the fear of the other in yourself. So you project your hate on somebody else because you're afraid of it in yourself. And this gets to Conrad's point of the heart of darkness is really, and this is where we could be uh, sympathetic to what Conrad's trying to do. It's it's not that Kurtz went into the heart of darkness, into the African jungle and went mad. He was mad to begin with and just went further in his madness with this frenzy of profit, efficiency, money, right? Power uh, of aggrandizing his ego, right? And this is what is. And it was, in the end, what, what puzzles Marlowe at first when he's sent to look for Kurtz is that Kurtz is still bringing ivory, but it's not even talking to the people at the central station. He just sends the boat with the ivory and then he turns his back to civilization. Oh, yes. He says, what made him turn his back to civilization? So he goes to see what is there that he, what has he found that makes him want to stay there instead of going back? And what he found is a way to completely rule. He has a house surrounded by human heads that he's killed. I mean, he... And what's funny, I mean, it's not funny at all, but <laughs> an interesting aspect of this, the heads on the poles, they're all looking at the house. So they're kind of arranged in a way that he sees their faces at all times. Mm. So it's not like even you'd say, okay, it's a warning to enemies. No, he gets something out of looking at them and knowing I killed you. Wow. And this is one thing that is captured also in um, Apocalypse Now, which is if you curious if yeah, you heard of Apocalypse talking about Mouse. that yeah it's a great movie it's a movie that part in part is based on heart of darkness and and it takes place in vietnam but it takes place in vietnam but it what it tries to show is that this imperialistic binary mind is not just uh doesn't just belong to british colonialism it is just something that um, is a very human tendency to and it's one reason why people go to war and why people try to subjugate other people and destroy and kill. And so this idea that you're superior, they're superior. So Apocalypse Now and the war, the Vietnam War was informed by the same kind of language. They are savages. They are different. They are the other, mm -hmm. but it, it was a different culture. Yeah. Well, excellent. There's definitely more we could talk about. There's a lot. If there's more. a few comments that we can get to or questions, I think we could we could spare a good 
maybe five minutes. I do need to rush to my class at 2.30, but yeah, are there any questions or comments that we can? There is a question from Christopher Nelson. Oh, that guy. I'll skip I him. him. <laughs> you won't have anything important to add here. Right. Now, what, is it, what does he have to say? About here? Is it cheating to propose that Conrad, the author, was doing indirectly through an anti-hero narrative what Achebe endeavors to do more directly. That's what Edward Said, uh, I think, argued, is that he was this anti-hero that was, um, you know, one thing he points out, Said, is Marlowe is not Conrad, clearly, right? This is a character. It's, you know, we do this with music a lot. Like, um, I, I can't think, well, yeah, Ben <laughs> Harper, right? He has this anthem for anybody who loves to imbibe in uh, cannabis, right? I'm going to burn one down. Well, it turns out Ben Harper has never smoked cannabis, right? And so we, we get the sense the artist is just conveying something inner in them. And certainly Conrad is conveying something inner in him um, and any artist who does. But uh, it, is, it, it is probably a good idea to try to separate the artist from the characters or the art that they are putting out into the world because it's not always, it's sometimes, but it's not always an expression of who they actually are. They're, they're just observing, this is what's going on in the world. I want to express that. Yeah, I mean, definitely Marlowe is a character and we can look at, at Marlowe more critically today <clears throat> and, and maybe speculate that Connor did mean to create this very obtuse character and show how narrow-minded uh, colonialists were. But at the same time, Conrad himself wrote a few essays in which he talked about Africans almost in the same way as Marlowe. But I can, what I can say that redeems, in a way, I'm going to say, use Marlowe's word, words, what redeems uh, Conrad is that maybe he has some self-criticism and maybe looking back at what, how he felt at his maybe culture shock, I guess he was going through at the time mm. that he was in Africa. Maybe looking back later, he kind of tried to distance himself from the young, his young self who was there and was so prejudiced and try to see that as what it was, prejudice, because he actually uses the word prejudice uh, a couple of times in the book. And he, Marlowe admits at some point that he, he himself has some prejudices or that probably he can't escape. So, so it is a little bit of an anti-hero that Maybe it's the demon that Con Conrad is trying to get rid of from himself. Like, okay, I'm going to purge him out of myself and talk about how pernicious this mentality is. So I, I can't really speak for, Mar for, for Conrad. <laughs> Achebe for sure thought that, that Conrad was Marlowe. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's not quite so simple. I think that he was a much more complicated person than, than Marlowe. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, th I think we got a lot done there in this. I mean, this talk could really be uh, a good three, four hour podcast, but uh, I think we touched on a lot of what Eche Chihuahua Echebe um, brought to the discussion here and it was badly needed. And uh, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, understandable given the history um, that it took 76 years for a, a, a decent piece, piece of yeah. criticism of this book, which adds to the book, right? It makes it a little bit more dimensional once you have a Chebe's background, whether you've read Things Fall Apart or have heard it from uh, people who have read the book and have given it some thought. So thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you for having yeah, me here. Yeah. And uh, there'll be more to come. We'll announce more podcasts on the heart of darkness coming forward, but you all have a good afternoon and see you all later. Thank you.